All right. So <clears throat> I need y'all to stop talking. And then, like I told you, um, this is coming straight from this. I don't even know the name of the book. I have it right. Yeah, it's right here. So this AP Calc, AP exam. There I got it. So this is all AB topics, everything that you need. Um, so you took the diagnostics that was in the front. And again, that was just to give me an idea. That's really not trying to give you an idea of where you would be. Does everybody understand that? Like literally um, where you need to be. I think, and I wrote it on the last paper that we had, 34 to 44 points you need from your, um, from your multiple choice to get that dead set three. So each point is worth one, uh, each question is 1.2, okay? So if you multiply how many you got right by 1.2, you can see how far off from a three, four, five you are. It's a lot. Does everybody understand that? So hopefully now that we're going over this and now that you're studying those rules, that, that little information will come up, okay? So don't, again, it's just to know where you are at this moment and how much more you need to study. If you want to study, but I told you, if you're done, you're done and that's, that's on you, but I'm going to teach those that want to be taught. Um, you can make a three on this exam. You can make four and a five on this exam. Um, I've seen all of them. I've also seen a bunch of ones from people that don't care to do anything. Do I understand that? So it, it's literally whatever you're willing to work for. All right. <clears throat> so I'm not going to read everything on here. I'm going to let you do a lot of it, but we're going to talk about limits. So the the first couple chapters are like, how do you take the AP exam? And we'll talk about those later, but the chapter three starts actually doing uh, calculus problems. So the first thing that we talked about are limits and it's gonna talk about the different ways that we found limits. So the first one is, remember when we made the charts and we put it, you know, you know what I'm talking about, like 0 0.9999, 0 0.999, 0 0.99, and we kept going. So that's what it's talking about. So on this one, if we're trying to find the limit of f of x equals x squared as it approaches two, we're gonna get closer and closer and closer to two. That's what these little decimals are for. And what happens as we get closer to two? How else could we do this limit? So it is this, you can write this down. Anything that I write down, I would write down. How else would I do this? We already know how to do limits. We don't need this book to tell us how to do it. There are a couple that we're gonna talk about that are different. You don't have to graph it, you can do what? Plug in the two. As long as it doesn't cause an indeterminate form, you know that you can find that limit. So on this one, when I plug in the two, I get four and it says, as X increases and approaches two, F of X gets closer to four. This is called the left-hand limit and you can do the left-hand limit, that's fine. Then they did the other side where it was above two, but it kept getting smaller and smaller, closer to two and it still shot it to four. So that was the right-hand limit. So remember we did the left and the right before. Okay, this is that chart, guys, and one more time. So we had the chart that looked like this, and we would have two in here with a question mark, and then they would have 2.0001, 2.001, 2 like that. Does that everybody understand that's what they're doing right now? So this one would be the right side. This one would be the left side where it would be 1.999, 1.99. If all else fails, do this, okay? So on your exam, if all else fails and it's calculator active, obviously you can do this, okay? So if it's a really hard one, like X squared is obviously not hard, but if it was a really hard function, all right? So again, since both of them, Since both of them go to four, your limit is four. And that's what it says, okay? So that's what this paragraph says. You got the answer four because they both go to four. Uh, we didn't really need to look at all the decimal values to know what was gonna happen when X got really close to two, but it's important to go through the exercise because typically the answers get a lot more complicated. So that's what I said. This one's really easy, but if it gets a little more complicated, you can always use a chart. So this first one, don't, don't freak out because these are easy ones. How do you find the limit of x squared as x approaches five? What is five squared? As long as it doesn't cause an indeterminate form, you're literally just gonna plug in. So what about the next one, the limit of x cubed as x approaches three? Three cubed, which is 27, that's it. All right, so then there are some rules. 
<clears throat> these rules are rules that you just did on your quiz. Some of them are and some of them are not. Okay. So we'll get to some that maybe you haven't seen. I'm not sure that they're in the, the cheater rules. So you may want to make some note cards for them. I'm not going to put them on the quiz, but you may need them at some point just so that you have them. All right. So this one is in the quiz. The limit as X approaches A of K times F of X equals K times the limit as X approaches A of F of X. So just to give you an example, and if you have to do this, this is what I was talking about on your quiz, like, I don't know what this is saying. What does K represent? A constant. So if I had the limit, as X approaches, we'll say zero, of two times X to the fourth minus six. Very good. I can change it to two times the limit as X approaches zero of X to the fourth minus six. And we already knew that we can pull that constant out. Okay. Another rule. So it says the example is the limit of three X squared as X goes to five. We can pull that three out again. There's a good example. And then we just plug it in. So five squared is 25 times three is 35. So I got it. So again, if you want to write that down, it would be three times five squared, which gives you that 75. In the next box, if the limit as X approaches A, this one is going to take up quite a bit of box. I'm just going to let you know it's going to be a two-liner for me so that I can have it big enough for you to be able to see. Of F of X equals L1. And the limit as X approaches A of G of X equals L2. Then the limit as X approaches A of F of X plus G of X equals L1 plus L2. Right, so they give you a little example right underneath it. And it says the limit of X squared plus X cubed as X approaches five, you can split up and then we can direct substitute. So five squared plus five cubed. What is five squared? What is five cubed? And 25 plus 125 is 150, just so you know where the 150 comes from because they don't work those out for you. Right. This one is also a two liner. If the limit as X approaches A of F of X equals L1 and the limit as X approaches A of G of X equals L2. This one is the multiplication, the limit as X approaches A of F of X times G of X equals L1 times L2. And again, they don't work it out for you, so I want to make sure that I work it out. So they split it up. You're multiplying these two functions. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to distribute them or do anything. You can just follow the rules. So we can split it up. This will give you a direct substitution of five squared plus one times the square root of five minus one. What is five squared? 25 plus one is? What is five minus one? Square root of four is? And 26 times two is? All right. 
So now how would I do example three? Don't make it too complicated. How would I do example three? What's the first thing we always do? Try to direct substitute. So zero squared plus five times zero gives us, and that is perfectly fine, right? So far, so good. All you uh, do to find the limit of a simple polynomial is plug in the number that the variable is approaching and see what the answer is. Naturally, the process can get messier, especially if x approaches zero. All right, so the limit as x approaches zero of one over x squared, if you plug in some very small values for x, you'll see that it approaches infinity. And it doesn't matter whether x is positive or negative, you still get infinity. So look at the graph on both sides. The left and the right. Again, on both sides, the left and the right. What happens to the graph as it goes to zero from the left and the right? Goes to infinity. So it goes to infinity on both sides, left and right. So, the limit as x approaches zero of one over x squared is gonna equal infinity. All right, so let's look at the next one. When you look at the graph of the next one, what's different about it? Did everybody have that? Sorry. Is everybody good? Yeah, hold on just a second. All right. So the limit as x approaches zero from the left and the limit as x approaches zero from the right. What do you notice from the left? Where does it go? Left is this side, negative infinity. From the right, okay, so we're gonna flip it over. And that's exactly what it says on this side. You can see that on the left side of x equals zero, the curve approaches negative infinity and on the right side, positive infinity. There's some very important points that we need to emphasize from the last two examples. So why do we state that the limit in example four, but not for example five? Because when we have k over x squared, the function is always positive. So that puts that graph up to the top. But when we have k over x, the function sign depends on the sign of x and you get a different limit from each side. So on this one, what happens? What happens if it goes the opposite directions? What happens if it goes in opposite direction? Like what's the limit? It doesn't exist, that's what I'm looking for. So the limit as x approaches zero, I think we had one over x, right? Mm -hmm. Of one over x does not exist. So we're gonna look at a few examples in which the independent variable approaches infinity. So this first one, find the limit of one over X as X approaches infinity. So go back to that graph. As X approaches infinity, where does this graph go? That's it. So when we graph it, We get this and the limit as x bridges infinity. So remember, that's what happens as we go to the right as far as we can of one over x 
it goes to zero, never touches, but it gets as close as possible. Well, what about negative infinity? Still goes to zero because on this side, it jumps up there as well. Good. So the limit as X approaches negative infinity of one over X equals zero. We don't have the same problem here that we did in X approach zero because positive zero is the same thing as negative zero, whereas positive infinity is different than negative infinity. So here's another rule. And there's all kinds of stuff. If it's, y'all, if it's box in, read it. Okay, if it's box in, read it. You don't have to right now, but it's, it's the same thing that we just did, but they just put it in a box for you to look at like, this is important instead of making you read through the whole thing. All right, if K and N are constants, the absolute value of X is greater than zero and N is greater than zero, then the limit as X approaches infinity of K over X to the N. So a constant and X to any power is equal to zero. And the limit as X approaches negative infinity of K over X to the N is also equal to zero. Any questions? What? Mm -hmm. So what about this one? What about this one? Yeah, you're going to, but how do you know that you put it over the highest power? So that's the question that I want to ask. Those are things like, we know that we could probably do that. We also know we could use what? The Hopital's rule. Yeah. So we have a lot of, a lot of means to find limits because we already know how to do them. But my question is, what made you have to do that? Okay. Well, when we look at this and we think about the Hopital's rule, when we were looking at just the top. What kind of function is 3x plus 5? This function is linear. The bottom function is also going to be linear, which means it looks like this. So as x approaches infinity, so as it goes to the right, what does this function do? It goes to infinity. This causes one of those indeterminate forms. So you can do it multiple, you know multiple ways now. Okay, you can do a lot of rule. You can divide by the highest power on the bottom. That's what we're going to do on this one. This one does not go over Lovato's rule at all. Okay, but can you use it? Sure, sure. So this one doesn't. It says you get the indeterminate form infinity over infinity. So to solve this, we do the highest power of X in this case. So X on the bottom and we divide every term by that. So we do the limit as X approaches infinity. And a lot of times I leave that part off and I'm dividing if you want to, that's fine as well. So we have three X over X plus five over X, seven X over X minus two over X. What happens? Mm -hmm. So then when we do the limit of a constant, we get the constant. We just found out the limit as X approaches infinity of anything over X, a constant over X is gonna be zero. So that's why it goes away. On the bottom, we have seven minus and anything over X, constant over X is gonna be zero. What does that give you? All right, just to throw it out there, La Pottles rule says you can do what? Derivative of the top and? Derivative of the bottom. What's the derivative of the 3x plus 5? Derivative of the 7x minus 2? 3 over 7. Does not matter which way you do it. It's all the same. Everybody good? All right. So again, just reminding you of all the things that you can do. Same thing on this one. Same thing on this one. So find the limit 
as x approaches infinity of x squared minus 4x plus 1, 6x squared plus 7x minus 2. Remember, when we see infinities, we want to simplify as much as we can, and then we can graph it out. But on this one, what are we going to do? We can do it a couple of different ways. Yeah, what do we do? Divide by x squared highest power. So 8x squared over x squared minus 4x over x squared plus 1 over x squared all over 16x squared over x squared plus 7x over x squared, the highest power, yep. So are these the type of problems we'll say are the free response? These are gonna be the So your free response is like, do this and this and y'all saw them. Y'all saw what it was. It's not just like, hey, take the derivative. It's like the speed, the acceleration. Da, 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 da. So those problems that we saw, and we'll go over free response. So don't stress about free response. Let's let's work on our three from the from the multiple choice, and then we'll get some booster points, fours and fives from from everything else. Okay. And remember, if you if you attempt, I mean, you can get a zero, obviously. But if you're doing at least something right in your uh, free response, then you can earn points. So you always want to try. Always. Got it? All right. So then your x squares canceled out. All of these turn into what? Zeros. Because your x will cancel out here. And that'll leave you with 4 over x and 7 over x. And then everything is over some power of x, a constant over the power of x. So we're left with eight over 16 or one half. And that's it. All right. What about the next one? Yeah, they just made this one look ridiculously hard by putting the power of 10, right? It's the same thing. So negative three x to the tenth over x to the tenth minus seventy x to the fifth over x to the tenth plus x to the third over x to the tenth all over thirty three x to the tenth over x to the tenth plus two hundred x to the eighth over x to the tenth minus one thousand x to the fourth over x to the tenth. Your x to the tenths cancel out. Everything cancels out the top. You want that constant on the top. You don't want the x on the top. So that's the biggest thing. So we don't want x's on top. It doesn't really matter what's on the bottom. And then everything here goes to zeros. What are we left with right here? Negative three over 33, which reduces to negative one over 11. Don't forget the negative. The other powers don't matter because they're all going to disappear. Now we have three new rules for evaluating the limit of a rational expression as x approaches infinity. I did not, I did not take these off. So just make sure we're going to go over them really quick. If the highest power of x is a rational expression in the numerator, then the limit as x approaches infinity is infinity. Um, if the highest power of x in a rational expression is in the denominator, so here's, here's the thing. Highest power in the numerator, infinity. Okay. The next one, the highest power, the denominator, then it's zero. And we could work these out, but we don't have to. We don't have to. Okay. Sound good. Sorry, I didn't say I'm going to highlight your chart. And then the last one says, <clears throat> excuse me, if the highest power of x in a rational expression is the same, the highest power is the same. 
It's the coefficient of the highest term in the numerator divided by the coefficient of the highest term in the denominator. So that's the one where we divide by x to the seventh. So everything will cancel out. All right. Sorry. So the the new, and I mean we had this, but I don't know that you remember it. But I want you to. So at some point during the exam, you'll have to find the limit of certain trig expressions, usually as x approaches either zero or infinity. There are four standard limits that you should memorize. So these limits I would memorize. Okay. Does everybody understand? These are the ones that I said. I'm not going to put them on the quiz, but it's something that you probably should know. So you might want to go ahead and make some note cards for those as well. All right. So the first one is the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is one. X is in radians, not degrees. Okay. So the limit, we're going to do this in a minute, of sine x over x is one. Let's flip the paper. Again, anything in the boxes is important. So then it goes through why. This may seem strange, but if you look at the graphs of it, sorry, sine x and x, they have approximately the same slope near the origin, which is where x gets closer to zero. Because x and the sine of x are about the same as x approaches zero, their quotient will be very close to one. Furthermore, because the limit of cosine x as x approaches zero equals one, review your cosine rules, we know that the limit as x approaches zero of tan is sine x over cosine x or zero. Now we'll find the second rule. So they just gave you the first rule. Now we're gonna talk about the second rule. Uh, we have the limit as X approaches zero of cosine X minus one over X. The first thing you're gonna do is multiply the top and bottom by cosine X plus one, so the conjugate. So I might write it this time, but I may not write it the next time. So limit as X approaches zero. Cosine x minus one over x, that's what we have right here. And then by your conjugate plus one. We're gonna distribute that. Remember when they're conjugates, you only have to multiply the first and the last because the middles will cancel out. So we get cosine squared x minus one over, and I'm just going to squish these two together, cosine x plus one times x. If you don't know your trig identities, especially this one, please, please study it. So we know that sine squared x equals one minus cosine squared x. What's wrong with this compared to this one? The signs are switched. So what's going to happen to sine squared x? It's going to be negative. So we're going to change it to negative sine squared x over x times cosine x plus one. We're going to break it into two limits. Remember that we know now what sine x over x is. So we're going to break it into negative sine x over x. That would leave another sine x on top since it's sine x squared. And on the bottom, cosine x plus one. So from that box on the previous page, what was the limit of sine x over x? One. So what would be the limit of negative sine x over x? Negative one. So the first limit is negative one. And then what about this one? What about this one? What did it say about sine x over cosine x anyway? It's zero. These are so close to each other. Remember that it's going to be zero anyway, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, so that's the second rule that they're going to do. So then we have negative one times zero, which will give us zero. 
So rule number two that you want to study is that cosine x minus one over x is zero. That's what we just found. You could your next thing. Find the limit of sine three x over x as x approaches zero. So this one tells you a different way to find it, and I don't necessarily like this one. What is another way that we could do this one? Yeah, I would have done it by that because I know the derivatives and it'll make it a little bit easier, but I'm gonna go over this. If you like this, keep this, I don't care. You can use a simple trick, multiply the bottom and the top of the expression by three. This gives us the limit as x approaches zero of three sine three x over three x. How are you going to do after school, Sophie? You know? Much nature. All right. Uh, next, substitute a letter for 3x, for example, a, and we get the following. So all they're doing is a substitution. So here, they say that a equals 3x. So instead of using that, they use a. And then sine A over A would be one. It doesn't matter what those numbers are. And then we have the three on the outside that multiplies it by three. But if we did Lohapadol's rule, what would we have? What's your derivative? Cosine three X times three on the bottom one. Put in your rules or direct substitute. Cosine of zero times three. What is cosine of zero? One times three is three. So I don't care which way you do it, but this is much simpler to me than remembering to multiply everything by three. Does that make sense? So again, we know different means of doing it. I would do the easier one. So look at 12. We're actually going to do the work on the next page. So we're going to find the limit of sine 5x over sine 4x. And again, we're going to do this a little bit different. We get a bit more sophisticated if you're using this rule. First, divide both the numerator and the denominator by x, so the highest power in the bottom. Again, I do not like this way, but if you understand this way, use it. Next, multiply the top and the bottom of the numerator by five and the denominator by four. So the same thing that we just did, but we didn't like. So again, we're just putting a five in front of both parts. So here and here, and then we're gonna do a four. Four sine four X over four X. We would replace it to be five sine A over A by uh, four times. Sine A over A. What's your um, limit of sine A over A? What do we, that was that first rule that we just talked about, one, right? Which gives us five over four. But again, what's another way that you can do it? We'll have model rule, okay? So it'll make it a little bit easier if you know your derivatives. All right, so there's two more rules. So now you don't have to multiply at all. You can just use this. If you have sine of AX over X, it's gonna give you whatever that, um, whatever that letter is. So if we go back to the one that we just did, we had sine 5x over 5, something like this would just give you, sorry, over x, not over 5, would just give you 5. Okay, so there's just an example of looking at it. Or if you had sine, like we just had 5x over sine 4x, 
four X, it would give you five over four. Okay. Using trig identities, you can replace one minus cosine squared X with sine squared X. So remember, we're gonna find the limit of this as it approaches zero. How else could we do this? Yeah, you can do it every time. Every time. As long as it's in a fraction. If it's not in a fraction, you got to figure out a way to put it in a fraction. So, but we're going to do it the way it wants us to. And we're going to change it to x squared. Sorry, that's the normal function. We're going to change it to x squared over sine squared x. This is the same thing as x over sine x times x over sine x. These are things that I would not see you doing, okay? But you can. These are the exact same as these up here. If we flip it around and we have x over sine, you're gonna get one. So it's the same thing, one times one or one. All right, here are other examples for you to try with the answers right beneath them. Give them a try and check your work. I didn't give you the answers. We're gonna go over them. So I don't care how you do it. Tell me how you find the limit. Yeah, we're gonna try. We're gonna try to direct substitute. What do we get? That is okay because that's not an indeterminate form. That gives you what? Zero. That's good. So your answer is zero. What about the next one? What? We have a zero on the bottom. What's wrong with that? We can't divide by zero. So we got to do this a different way. So they do the left side and then they do the right side. We know better ways to do it. It doesn't matter. Um, the left hand limit. So the limit as X approaches three to the left. Now, the reason I'm doing it this way is because when's the last time we've done left and right hand limits? It's been a while. So I wanted to review that as well. So I think it's good to know. Of X plus two over X minus three. So let's check this out. Nope. Sorry, y'all. As it approaches three from the left, where does it go? From the left is down to negative infinity. All right, and the right hand limit, so the limit, oh my God, just put the limit. As X approaches three from the right of X plus two over X minus three equals. So we're coming from the right, where does it go? Infinity. The two limits are not the same, therefore, it does not exist. Good. All right, what about the next one? Okay. Why is it an indeterminate form if we direct substitute? Okay, so what do we need to do? You can find the left and the right hand limit. So y equals x plus two, x minus three squared. We're gonna graph. From the left, as it approaches three, that's what we're doing right now. Where does it go? From the left, it goes up to infinity. From the right, it goes up to infinity. So the left hand limit is infinity. The right hand limit is infinity. 
So what is the limit as X approaches three of X plus two over X minus three squared? Infinity because they both go to infinity. What's wrong with the next one? It's going to give you a zero on the bottom. So it'll cause an indeterminate form. Um, if you direct substitute, and I know that you probably know this, and that's fine, but I just want to write it. Gives you zero over zero, which is an indeterminate form. So how can we fix it? couple different ways we can do it, but I would factor it. Why would I factor this? Because I know that like so four, like if I think about it, I can factor the top. What are your factors of four that, add, I mean, eight that add to six, four and two. So I already have that on the bottom. So X plus four and X plus two over X plus four. Your X plus fours cancel out. Now we have the limit as X approaches negative four of X plus two. And what would I do? I can direct substitute from here. Negative four plus two is negative two. What's another reason I had to factor? Remember if your top is bigger than your bottom, your top power bigger than your bottom power. What happens if they're the same? Divide by the highest power. So this one, we're going to do 15x squared over x squared. And guys, on your um, on your exam, you know what's going to happen here. So don't do all the work if you don't have to, especially if it's multiple choice. If it's free response, you obviously want to do all the work. But if it's multiple choice, what is it going to be? What's going to happen? 15 over 22. So these are going to cancel out. One of your x's are going to cancel out. And you're going to get 15 over 22. If you can reduce it, reduce it. This one will not. Two more with me, and then the rest are for you. So, what about this one? Think about the things that we, we talked about today and the rules that they gave us today. What could I do? Kinda, if you can. If you take out the four, it gives you X over 10 X, right? Okay. What up? Did we use any rules with 10? We did sine and cosine, right? So how can I make 10 look like sine and cosine? Okay, so I'm gonna leave that four up there for just a minute. You're not wrong in taking it out. We'll talk about it in a second. What's the problem with this? So what do I do? So I'm gonna get four X, I'm gonna flip it over cosine X over sine X. Tell me out of this, what a rule was that I learned. Do you see a rule within this that I learned today? You get what I'm saying. I don't get what you're saying. Oh, no, it's like, yeah. um. I said they're the ones that you probably want to make note cards for, but I'm not testing on them. Rule number one. And rule number three or four? Four. You had one that looked like this. And one that looked like this. And they told you that the limit was one. What else do I have in here other than that? So Andrew said, take the four out. Then I have X over sine X. And then I have cosine X on the top. So I'm splitting this up. Is 
it said that X over sine X was one. We're doing as X approaches zero. So what would cosine X be? One, and what's your limit? Four, that's it. Remember that you could also do Lobato's rule because it's a fraction. So it's just whatever you know. All right, look at this one. This is the last one. What do we do? What happens if I direct substitute? I get zero over zero actually. So an indeterminate form. So what do I need to do? I need to fix it somehow. How do, how do you think I should do that? You get this problem on the test. What do you start somewhere? Where do you think you should start? Yeah. What do I do with those parentheses? Multiply them out. Yeah. Double distribute, multiply them out. So what am I going to get? Mm -mm. There you go. Don't forget the middle. You're not wrong. You did the first and the last. Make sure when it's the same signs, you do the middle as well. So what we're going to get is 25 plus 10h plus h squared. That's when I multiply that. On the top, I have a minus 25. And then I have it over h. What can I do now? And one of the h's is going to cancel out. So I would get 10 plus h. Now what can I do? Direct substitute. 10 plus 0 is don't think that you don't know how to do it find something find something to do okay is that right good all right uh the practice problems are yours to do we will probably start by going over those tomorrow those of you that are not in here we will record those for you okay very good and then we'll move on to chapter four